so good to be with you. Thank you for coming this morning, and thank you for joining us online this morning. We really appreciate you, and really want to trust that God's going to speak to your heart. A couple of quick things, and then I want to pray over the offering and get right into the Word this morning. Uh, so many of you know that we are doing our Thanksgiving outreach, which will be done uh, this Wednesday will be the last day to bring food in, and then things will be packed up. We'll pray over it on Sunday. Many of you will get a chance to take boxes out with you on that Sunday to deliver to other folks that, that uh, will be listed on those. Others will be delivered on Wednesday. Meals will be delivered on Wednesday. So we're feeding about 170 or 180 people this week. And so thank you for giving to that. Your generosity and your participation makes that possible. There are a number of ways to participate, and that's out on the table in the foyer. If you're online, and you would like to know how to participate in that as well, there should be a link or just email us at connect, dot, uh, connect at manna dot church, and we'll be happy to get that information to you. Or if you know a family that's in need and we might be able to help them, serve them, minister to them, you can share that with us as well. We would love for you to do that. So uh, today we're going to be doing our second portion, our second part of the Blessed Life series. And so Dr. Uh, uh, Robert Morris is going to be speaking to us again. Uh, this is video. This is a simulcast. And so we're going to be receiving him from South Lake, Texas. But God has just anointed him to speak on this issue. I've heard him several times. And every time I hear him, even the same message, something uh, opens in my heart, in my spirit, to understand more, that it's not about uh, you know, being, having a blessed life is not about what we give, it's how we give, it's who we put first in our life. And today he's going to talk to us about the principle of first. And this is so vital and so important. I want you to open your heart. If you didn't get notes when you came through the door, lift your hands. We want to get notes and put them in your hand right now. Uh, but if, you, uh, if you're online and you want to get notes, you can download those. There's a link for that as well. Please download the notes. It really will help you. But open your heart. In fact, I want to pray right now. We'll pray uh, over the offering, and then I want to pray over the message of the Word. All of these components of today's ministry are part of our worship to God, both our giving and our receiving. Holy Spirit wants to do something rich in our hearts. And so, please... Put aside your, uh, your preconceived ideas, even the idea of what am I doing watching a video in church. Listen, we want to give you the very best insight and very best help, and that's why we're doing it this way. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we are so grateful to you. We are grateful to you for the opportunity to gather together. Lord, it wasn't so long ago we could not do that. We're grateful for those that are online joining with us today. We're grateful for those in the 9 o'clock and also in the 11 o'clock service, God. We are thankful that all through this community you have united us by your Spirit. And today, God, I want to pray. I want to pray, Father, over the offering that has been given, that will be given. Lord, we receive that as from you. You have blessed our lives, and we bring back to you the first portion, and we present it to you as an offering unto the Lord in Jesus' name. And Father, today, as we get ready to hear your word, we pray that you would uh, bless our ears to hear. God, that you would immediately help us to disengage with everything else around us and to engage with your Holy Spirit. That, Father, we would listen to the word as it's being taught and that your word would enter our heart like seed and that it would bear fruit that would transform our lives forever. I pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. God bless you. Would you join me as we welcome Dr. Morris? Welcome to all the campuses, and I want to say welcome to the churches that are joining us by simulcast. We welcome every weekend uh, gateway, but I'd like to just welcome them again. Can you welcome uh, 38 churches that are joining us by simulcast right now? So we're very grateful that you're here. And I want you to turn your Bibles to one passage of Scripture. We'll go through some others, but we'll just look at one, Exodus 13. We'll just go to one, uh, Exodus chapter 13. And uh, as you're getting to Exodus 13, let me just say this. This is, in my opinion, the most important message in the series. We're in a, the series called The Blessed Life, and this is probably the most important message in the series. The title of this message is The Principle of First. 
the principle of first. And I want to make this statement. If God is first in your life, then everything will come into order. Now, I'm not saying you won't have difficulties or problems or go through struggles. Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation. But would you rather go through tribulation with everything in order <laughs> or everything out of order? And hear me, if Jesus is first, if God's first, everything will come into order in your life. If he is not first, then nothing will come into order in your life. God has to be first for there to be order in your life. So I want to show you this principle because this principle is a principle that runs all through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Here, so let's start Exodus chapter 13. Look at verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. It is mine. It belongs to me. I wish that I could adequately explain to you how emphatic the language is in the Hebrew here, this phrase, it is mine. It is my property. It belongs to me. I'm the owner. It's extremely emphatic. It's very important to understand that when we talk about the principle of first. The firstborn, he says, belongs to me. Okay, now look at verse 12. That you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. Very similar language in the Hebrew, shall belong to God. They'll be the Lord's. But every first, firstborn, now we'll talk about this, of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Very important. A donkey will be redeemed with a lamb. Now watch this phrase. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. It's very important to understand that if you don't redeem it, you're going to lose it anyway. And I want you to apply that as we talk about the first of our finances, the first 10%. He says, you're, if, you don't, if you don't bring it to me, you're going to lose it. You're still going to lose it. It's going out of your account. Watch this. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. All right, so I have three points. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, that's a longer point than I normally have, and so we'll make sure and leave it up long enough for you to be able to, to write it down. The firstborn must be. There, there, there is, there, the, I, 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 I've prayed over this language before, uh, whether I should say it this way. But according to Scripture, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. That's the principle here in the Old Testament that is referring to a principle that goes all through the Bible. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Okay, but how do you know which to do? How do you know whether you sacrifice it or redeem it? Well, he gives two animals which are exemplary of categories of animals. He, he, he gives us the donkey and the lamb, okay? The donkey represents unclean animals, and the lamb represents clean animals, so how do you know which to do? Well, if it's a clean animal, it has to be sacrificed, the firstborn. If it's an unclean animal, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Let me say that one more time. If it's clean, firstborn. I'm hoping you kind of get ahead of me on this and understand what this represents. If it's a clean and it's firstborn, it has to be sacrificed. If it's unclean, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Okay, well, how in the world does this relate to us today? Well, let me ask you two, two questions, all right? First of all, were you and I spiritually born clean or unclean? In other words, when we were born in the natural, our spiritual state before God, were we born into this world, were we clean or unclean? unclean. We were all born in sin, right? I can prove it by simply asking the experts here, the parents, did you have to teach your children to be bad? <laughs> or did that come naturally for them? See, we have to teach them to be good. Is that right? Because we're all born with a sin nature. That's, that's what the Bible says, all right? So we were all born unclean. Was Jesus 
born unclean or clean? Clean. Okay, listen to me. Listen very carefully. The clean, Jesus, the clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. That's what we just read. (laughs) That's how important this principle is. And we're going to see that this principle refers to tithing, but I want to say something to you that maybe you've never thought of. Jesus is God's tithe. Because you see, you give the tithe first. You don't pay your bills and see if you have enough left over to tithe. You give the tithe first. It's the first 10%. It's not just 10%. It's the first 10% because it takes faith to give the first. See, God said, when your sheep has a lamb, give me the first one. It takes faith to give the first one before you have any more. You don't know if the sheep's going to produce any more. That takes faith. God didn't say, wait until your sheep has 10 and then give me one of them and you can give me the one that keeps getting in your garden that you don't like. (laughs) No, he said, you give me the first one before you have any others. See, so many people think it's not the 10% that enacts the blessing, it's the faith that enacts the blessing. It's giving the first 10%. And the reason I say that Jesus is God's tithe is because God gave Jesus first. He didn't wait to see if we would clean up or straighten up to give his son. God gave Jesus when we were mocking him and spitting on him and nailing him to a cross. Romans says it this way, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans also said this way, that God gave Jesus in hope, in hope. And that word, the root of that word is faith. In faith, we give our tithe in faith. So it's the first 10%. Think about this. When the children of Israel went into the the, uh, promised land, God said, bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of God. It's always into the house of God. That's always where the tithe goes. But why didn't he say 10% of Jericho? It's very simple. Because Jericho was the first city. That's simple. He said, bring the first into the house of the Lord, and the rest are redeemed. They're out from under the curse. They're blessed. See, the first portion has the redemptive, is the redemptive portion. The Please hear me. When you give the first to God, the rest are redeemed. That's what this is saying. So hear me clearly. (laughs) Don't give the first portion to the mortgage company because the mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. But God does. The first portion, first 10% goes to God. So the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Here's the second point. The first fruits must be offered. Again, I want to just key in on these words, must be. According to this principle that works all through Scripture, the first fruits must be offered. You can stay there in Exodus 13. Look at Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Bonuses, everything. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay, this says to honor the Lord with the first of our increase. I just want to just make a note here. This is in Proverbs. This is not the law. This is not under the law. This is hundreds of years after the law. This is a principle that runs all through Scripture. Let me show you another Scripture. Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits. I kind of like that phrase because it's like God is saying, listen closely if you don't know what first means. <laughs> the first of your first fruits, of the first fruits of your land. Now watch these words. You shall bring, that's an important word, bring into the house of the Lord your God. Now we, we saw last weekend about Malachi, he said, bring the tithes into the storehouse. The tithe always comes to the, to the church. You, don't, you can't divide your tithe. You can't designate your tithe. You can't give it somewhere else. But I want you to notice the word bring. The reason God uses the word bring instead of the word give when he talks about tithing is because you can't give what doesn't belong to you. You have two choices according to Scripture. And I know this is strong, 
but I've studied this for over 30 years now. You have two choices when it comes to the tithe according to Scripture. You can bring it or you can steal it. Those are the only two choices. There's no other choice according to Scripture. They either brought it or they stole it. Remember when God said, bring all the silver and gold from Jericho? That Achan kept some. And of course, the next city, then they lost the battle until they brought it to the house of God. But here was the point. In, in Joshua chapter 6, God calls the tithe consecrated or set apart. Same thing he called the firstborn. But in Joshua 7, once Achan took it, he said, Israel has stolen from me and they're cursed. They're cursed. It's consecrated when you bring it to the house of God. It's cursed if you leave it in your bank account. Here's a real simple, straightforward question. Why would you want something cursed in your bank account? I mean, it has enough problems. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want your bank account blessed? See, it takes faith to give the first. It takes faith to believe that 90% redeemed and blessed will go farther than 100% cursed. It takes faith. So you give the first. Um, uh, when I was in college, one of the uh, students asked one of the professors, why did God accept Abel's offering and he didn't accept Cain's? And the professor said, you know, I, I really don't know. And for some reason, I've always remembered that, but when the Lord showed me this principle of firstborn and firstfruits, it's, you actually will see why God accepted Abel's and he didn't accept Cain's. Watch Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5. And in the process of time, now those words are very important. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Notice it specifically does not say that he brought first fruits. He just brought an offering in the process of time. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected, or this word could be received, Abel and his offering. Notice the persons received too, not just the offering. But he did not respect or receive Cain and his offering. It's, it's simple, isn't it? Cain was a farmer. He didn't bring first fruits. Abel was a rancher. He brought firstborn. God said, I'll accept that. I will not accept that. Then accept it. Now, I'm going to take you a little farther in this, and that is that it's not just that God wouldn't accept it, it's that God couldn't accept it. There are some things God can't do. God can't act outside of himself. He can't act outside of his character. One of the greatest studies you could ever do would be the attributes of God, to know who God really is. Okay, so let me, let me tell you a, a few things that God can't do. Uh, number one, God can't change. He can't change. This is called the immutability. This would be the doctrinal theological word, the immutability of God. It's impossible for God to change. The reason God can't change is because if God could change, he could get better, and God can't get better because he's perfect. So God can't change. Uh, the second thing God can't do, I'll just give you, give you some examples, is that God can't think the way we think. Now, I'll clarify that because we know the Bible talks about the thoughts of God, but that actually proves this theology. God can't think the way we think. Let me just, just uh, help us with this. Um, we, the reason God can't think the way we think is because this is, here's the theological word, omniscient. Omniscience, the omniscience of God. Break it down, it's two words, omni-science. Science means knowledge, omni means all. God has all knowledge. So the reason God can't think the way we think is because we think to figure things out. God's not trying to figure anything out. Let, let me say it another way when we're talking about God's thoughts. Nothing has ever occurred to God. God has never said, you know what I just thought of? <laughs> I just thought of something I've never thought of before. He's never said that. You know why? Because he knows everything at the same time. Hey, I have a, a new little thought on this. Uh, when we talk about that God, nothing's ever occurred to God, let me, let me say it another way. God has never heard something and said, oh, my self.
I mean, he wouldn't say, oh, my God. Or he'd say, oh, my. Okay, all right, so. <clears throat> so God, God can't think the way we think. Now, when I said God can't think, you might have remembered a scripture and thought, wait, there's a scripture that talks about, uh-huh, that proves this. Here's what the scripture says in Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't think the way you think. As the heavens are above the earth, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I don't think the way you think. That's what he's saying. Okay, so there's some things God can't do. Let me tell you how this relates to this. God can't be second. He can't be second. This is called the preeminence of God. You know, you've heard of eminence, but God is preeminent. That means he's not only first of all, he's before all. He's higher than all. He's above all. He's first. He's before all. So God is first. Now, we, we, in our lives, we talk about putting God first, and that's good because we do need to put God first in our lives. But I just want you to know something. Even if God's not first in your life, he's still first. You didn't rearrange his order in the universe. He's still preeminent. So God can never be second. So this is why I'm telling you, the reason God couldn't accept Cain's offering is because God's always first, and Cain did not bring a first offering. God said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't accept a second place offering because I'm always in first place. I can't accept it. Now, we need to think about that when it comes to the tithe. You remember uh, I said Jesus is God's tithe? And I said to you last weekend, because we talked about giving to, to the bride of Christ, and I said that tithing is probably more personal to Jesus than what we think. Okay, I want you to think about this. If Jesus is God's tithe, Tithing might be a little more personal to the Father also than what we think. See, it represents who's first in your life. You, you can, and I'm, again, I know these, some of the things I'm saying are strong, but you can tell me all day God's first in your life, but let me see your bank account. And I'll tell you who's first. It, it might be Nordstrom's. Okay, ladies, let me hit the guys. It might be Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Where does the first 10% go? That's who's first. All right, so the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. The first fruits must be offered. Here's point three. The tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Leviticus 27, 30 says, and all, I want you to notice the word all, and all the tithe of the land, all of it, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. There's the emphatic phrase again, belongs to God. It is, it, God set it apart for himself. And that's what the next phrase says. It is holy. That word holy is the word that simply means set apart. It is set apart to the Lord. That's why it's stealing, because he set it apart to himself. And that's why it has to be first, because God's first and he owns it. So in, order, in other words, if we're going to return it, we have to return it first. Okay, so I'm going I'm to give you an illustration, um, and it's a math illustration, okay? So I'm warning you, so half of you can take a nap, all right? Um, I understand that. You're, you're strong in other subjects, math and English. I'm strong in those subjects. Uh, you know, I, I like gr grammar, you know, and uh, someone who watches our television program sent me a, a thing that said, I am a little sign for me to hang up my house that said, I am silently correcting your grammar right now. And I said to Debbie, I said, look at this. Do you like this? She said, yeah, except uh, you don't do it silently. <laughs> so I like math and English. My father is actually a mathematical genius. And that's no exaggeration. He's a genius when it comes to that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a genius, but numbers add up in my mind without me trying. If you, if you name some numbers, they're going to add up, and I'm, I'm not going to try to do it. It's just going to happen. That's the way I think. Um, we, we were, Debbie and I were buying something a while back, and it was $7.99. And the lady said, uh, I'll have to add the tax on the uh, calculator because the cash register's broken. And I said, it's 66 cents, like that. And she said, excuse me? I said, 66 cents. She looked at a minute, and then she did this. She said, uh, it's 66 cents. <laughs> I won't say, yes, I know that. But I did. I said, okay, so paid for it. We got out in the car, and Debbie said to me, how do you do that? How, how do you do that that fast? Now, I thought she was actually asking me how I did it. (Laughter) 
I found out later she couldn't care less how I did that. <laughs> she was just, you know, paying me a compliment as a, a wife honoring her husband, but she asked, how do you do that? So I said, well, sugar, uh, 7.99 is close to 8. Our tax rate is 8.25. 8 times 8 is 64. Quarter of 8 is 2. 64 plus 2 is 66. I said, that should happen in less than a second in your mind. <laughs> she said, it doesn't. <laughs> then she said, but I know what 25% off is. <laughs> So again, now being the man, you know, I, I'm thinking she's talking math. I did not realize until after the whole conversation she was not talking math. But I said to her, okay, if you're buying something for $100 and it's 25% off, I said, what does that mean? She said, it means it's a good deal. <laughs> and then she said, and if it's 50% off, it's free. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> she said, yeah. 50% off is the same thing as buy one, get one free. So it's free. There's 50% off, it's free. And if it's 75% off, you're making money. Which explains some difficulties we've had over the years with our checkbook. I saved us money today. You ever heard that one? <laughs> well, how come we lost? Okay, so, um, so I'm going to give you a math illustration, and so half of you can check out, all right, just for a moment. It's not a, a tough one either, right? Let's say that you're a landscaper, and you uh, come to our home, and Pastor Albert, um, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I call you, and I say, listen, uh, I'd like to add some trees and some plants and some Okay, let me make this uh, illustration realistic. Debbie would like to add some plants and some trees and some flowers and things, you know. And so you give me an estimate. You say, now, this is how much my materials will be. This is how much my labor will be. And my profit will be $1,000. You need to know you, the tithe is on the profit. It's not on all of this. It's on the increase, your personal increase, personal income. That's what we tithe on, okay? So... Um, so you say, are you agreeable to this whole price? I say, yes, I am. So after you do the job, I pay for all your materials, all your labors, and then for your profit, let's say that I give you 10 $100 bills. So you have $1,000 in your hand, okay? So this is the math part, right? So you have $1,000. Let me ask you two questions, all right? $1,000, the word tithe, remember, means 10%. So how much is the tithe? $100, all right? I know some of you still... Okay, carry those. Okay, but that's all right. That's okay. All right, so it's $100. That's right. But you have 10 $100 bills in your hand, so which one is the tithe? The first one. Yeah, okay. The one on top, someone said. All right, let me say it to you a different way, all right? It's the first one that leaves your hand. That's the tithe. In other words, if you go home and you say, let me set aside some for the mortgage, some for the car, some for utility, some for clothes, and here's God's part. No, that's not God's part. You gave God's part to the mortgage company. Because here's what a lot of people do. Okay, let me set aside some for this and this and this. And oh, there's not enough left over for God. Can I say something nicely to you but firmly? He wouldn't accept it anyway. Because our God does not accept leftovers. Matter of fact, he says it in Malachi. He says, you bring me the blind and the, and the lame animals and I do not accept them. I accept the first. That's all I accept. Okay, so how, how does this work out in my own life? I get paid on the 15th and 30th, and, uh, or the last day of the month, 30th or 31st, and it's directly deposited. So it's like it magically appears, you know, in my account. So what I do on the 15th and the last day of the month is while I'm having my quiet time in the morning, before I do anything else, I go online, and, and that's the way now. I think it's just easiest to give online. I go online, and I uh, send the tithe to Gateway Church. And for us, many of you know, it's a double tithe. It's been since 1985. God spoke just to do 20% to the local church and then give over and above that. So for us, it goes to, and what we do, by the way, is to let you know 10% is the tithe. We give 10% extra to heart for the kingdom every year. So that's how we can kind of estimate it when we come to that part of the, of the year, which will be in, in a few months, we'll come to that part where we all get to make a commitment over and above our tithe. So we, I send that on the 15th and the 30th, okay? So what happens, though, if I, I, I have an early morning meeting and um, I kind of rush out, I don't have my quiet time that day, 
and I get home that night and I think, oh, it's the 15th. I, I forgot to do the tithe. And I go in and I notice that Debbie has been to the grocery store that day. Okay, what I do? I don't say, oh, that's great, sugar. We're cursed. <laughs> it's great. I mean, you gave the tithe to Kroger's and so we're cursed now. No, because I'm not legalistic about it. And listen to me, God's not legalistic either. I'm not trying to give you a legalistic principle today. I'm trying to give you a principle that's about your heart. Where's your heart? God knows my heart and he knows your heart. Where's your heart? So the first 10% goes to the house of God. Now, Exodus 13, let me show you one more scripture and, and then we're finished, all right? We stopped a while ago at verse 13, so let's pick it up at verse 14. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? Okay, in other words, he's saying one day your son's going to ask you, why are you killing these animals? That you shall say to him, by strength of hand, by a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrificed to the Lord all males that opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeemed. Okay, I want you to, let's just bring this up to modern day. Let's think about this. The son uh, goes away to college. He gets his degree. He comes back. His dad says, hey, one of the things I like you to do is take over the books. And so one day the son is sitting in there, and he's got the books in front of him. Dad comes in from the field, and the son says, uh, Dad, um, uh, sit down, Dad. Uh, you know, you asked me to, you know, take over the books and uh, the business and all. And, Dad, I'm, 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 I've been going over the books. And, um, Dad, um, I want to talk to you about something, man. Um, you might not even know you do this. You know, Dad? Uh, we all have blind spots, you know, so not accusing you, just, just talking numbers now. Um, but, Dad, um, e every time uh, one of our animals has a, a firstborn, you, um, how shall I say this, uh, kill it. <laughs> and, uh, Dad, uh, I think it's getting out of hand uh, with you because you, you, you killed 72 animals last year. And um, um, we're, we're in the ranching business, Dad. And uh, th th this is cutting into our profits. So wh wh why do you do that? He said, one day your son's going to ask you. And he said, when he asks you, you say to your son, son, um, I need to tell you something about our family that you don't know. But we weren't always in the ranching business. We, we did not own animals. We didn't own land. Son, we were slaves. We were in bondage. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed us and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, we gladly give to God the firstborn of all of our increase. Now, this was written 4,000 years ago. And this principle happened to me. Uh, when Josh was kind of getting old enough to understand numbers and all, and he has this mathematical mind like I do and like his grandfather. And so one day I was paying the bills. Now, we didn't have online back then. And so what I would do is I would write the check first, and then I would set the check, the tithe check, and then I would set it over the side, and then I would pay the bills. But I'd always write the tithe check first and set it over the side and then take it with me to church. By the way, for you young people, we used to have pieces of paper called checks. <laughs> yeah. All right. So... I'd said it oversight. So I am paid the bills, and Josh came in, and I'm watching him out of the corner of my eye. And he's reading this tithe check, and he sees the amount, which to a, a young boy looks like a lot of money. And he says, Dad, why are you giving so much to the church? And I remember this scripture, when your son asks you, 
This is what you tell him. And I took Josh and I actually set him on my lap and I said to him, I need to tell you something about daddy that you don't know. But daddy wasn't always a Christian, son. And daddy was a very bad man. And daddy was in bondage. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed your daddy and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, I gladly give to God the first of all of my increase. This is a principle that's all through Scripture. It's called the principle of first. Is God first in your life? Is God first? I'd like you to bow your heads with me. I've said it before and I want to say it again. Just in case you missed it, this is not about your money. In fact, I went through our notes over the last nine months. In fact, all the way back to January, but over the last nine months, we've been heading up to, to this point. And all through this time, God has spoken to us through almost every message, regardless of who brought it, about our hearts. About where our heart is in relation to Him. Started all the way back in the parable series. And then... Throughout the last period of time with COVID, he's been really challenging us because church is not the same, this is not the same, that's not the same. The, everything has changed but God. He never changes regardless of the circumstance. He never changes regardless of the election results. He never changes regardless of what you feel in your physical, your emotional, or your spiritual being. He never changes. And this is about our confidence in a never-changing God that not only is able to bless us in the natural, but is able to deliver us from sin. Now, I don't know where you came from. I don't know what your background is. But I remember when Jesus interrupted my life and brought me out of darkness. Not just as a little kid the first time I prayed the prayer, but as a grown man when I had wandered my own way. And so this morning, God is calling to our hearts. There's a conviction upon our hearts. Don't go away with guilt. Don't go away with shame. Go away with a sense that God is speaking to me and adjusting me. And I want to obey. This is a very important message. And I know that you've received it. So whether you're online or in this room, I want to invite you to pray with me right now. Whether you tithe as a regular part or discipline of your life or whether you, you, you never tithed or you, you, you give a few dollars here. That, that this is not the point. The point is first, God. And if you settle that issue in your heart, everything else will align and change. Trust God first and He'll bless the rest. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for the grace that you've given Pastor Robert Morris to teach on this subject, Lord. Not just to us, but thousands of churches have done just what we're doing today. Not because I can't, but because I believe you have graced him in a way to deliver this message that is so healthy 
and so clear. So we ask you to bless him, and we thank you for Gateway Church who willingly gave to bless us and help us today. Now I pray, Father, for everyone that's sitting in this room or with, with us online or will watch later online, and I ask you to pray with me as well. Father, give us courage to trust you by faith, to believe that you're never changing and that if we put you first above everything else, you'll take care of us, not just here and now, but into eternity. There's no way I can trust you for what I cannot see if I can't trust you for what I can see. And that's just a reality. So, Father, we ask you to forgive us for our past unbelief and now empower us to obey and to trust you from this day forward with all of our life with all of our resources, and to put you first and to do that tangibly in the way we handle our finances, our time, our treasure, our talent, in Jesus' name. Now, if you're in this room or online and, listen, you've never trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you never understood that, and maybe today when he was talking about the fact that we were born in sin, we were born separated from God, and God gave His Son, His sinless Son, as a ransom for you. He substituted His sinless Son, Jesus, for you, who was born in sin, just like me, and redeemed you. But you hadn't realized that, or recognized that, or understood that, but today, somehow your heart was moved by that, and you'd like to receive Christ, and to receive that that. that uh, substitution by faith right now I want to help you do that it's a simple prayer it's not a simple process God did that process though so that you could take the simple step of faith and the first step is this prayer of confession you could pray something like this with me right now Father in heaven I confess to you that I am a sinner I've done it my way. I've chosen my path, not your path. But today, I'm, cho I'm choosing to believe in Jesus and accept your way. I ask you to forgive my sin. And I ask you to come into my heart. I believe that Jesus died for my sins so that I might live in His righteousness. And I receive that by faith right now. Come into my heart and help me to live for you all the days of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, I believe. That's a first step prayer. It says, God, I recognize where I was, and now I know where I'm supposed to go. I believe God responds to you. And I believe that's the first step toward Him, and God will honor you, and God will help you. If you prayed that prayer with us online, please connect at manna.church. Every week we get emails, and every week we respond. We love you. We're praying for you, and we just believe that God has a great plan for your life, and we want to help you to recognize that and achieve it. So let's pray together. Would you stand as we get ready to dismiss right now?